Who's he in that thing? Do what? Who is he with that thing? Okay. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to the February 14th, 2023 um, board meeting. I would like to say happy Valentine's Day to everybody, especially the ladies working in the public schools of Robinson County. Um, and we're going to try to get through this and get you home tonight. So, um, Miss Melissa Ocean, invocation by Minister Demetrius Whittington. Okay. And if you would, um, Miss Wanda Hunt passed away from Fair Grove. She worked in the cafeteria um, and drove a bus. So if we could have a moment of silence for that. Glory to God. Lord, we just want to say thank you for allowing us to come together one more time. Lord, we thank you for your strength right now in your people, God. And Lord, that your joy will be upon them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, that your unity will be upon them because where there's unity, there's strength, oh God. And Lord, we thank you, God, from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, that they shall be who you have called them to be and do what you have called them to do. Hallelujah. According to your word, oh God. And Lord, let we put in their heart, God, for your children, for the staff members, God, hallelujah, that they'll come together and make the decisions that need to be made, God, in the name of Jesus, and there will be growth, hallelujah, each and every school, there will be growth in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, and we thank you right now that it's already done, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you, Ms. Whittington. Um, adoption of the agenda. Ms. Terry? I was going to, um, I was going to request to add two items to the agenda, please. Okay. Well, we've already got a motion on the floor. You can do a substitute motion. I make a substitute motion that we add the following two items to the agenda. Um, just uh, some points of clarification on where we are with the EO curriculum. And also um, I would like an update from Mr. Schwartz on our um, uh, policy regarding um, supervisor retaliation. Supervisor retaliation. Okay, there's two motions on the floor, which to adopt the agenda and it has a second. Mr. Terry has made a substitute motion, um, which is to give clarity and points to curriculum and supervisor retaliation. We're gonna vote on the um, substitute motion first, but I need a second on that, Mr. Terry, from someone. Mr. Von Day has seconded. Um, we'll go ahead and vote on the substitute motion first. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay. All those opposed? Seeing none. We'll hold off on adopting the agenda. Um, the points of clarity for curriculum. Mr. Terry, your question is to, your question is to who? That was, that was a, a substitute motion to amend the agenda. Okay, so that would, the agenda has now, that, that motion to amend the agenda has now passed. Right. So now you need a motion to pass the agenda as amended. A motion to pass the agenda as amended. Mr. Henry. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we uh, uh, amend the agenda. I would think this would be in the information, the information items list as made. Thank you. 
Mr. Gentry with a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Mr. Chair, if I may, if we can add uh, those two amendments to be heard after the Black History Month review, please, sir, if we can add both. Thank you. Okay, the agenda's been amended and it'll be moved um, under, come after Black History Month, okay? Um, approval of the open session minutes. Uh, oh, Mr. Sorry. Chair, I, I need clarity. What was the second thing Mr. Terry said? I, I heard him say it twice, supervisory what now? Retaliation. Retaliation. Okay, thank you. Approval of the minutes, open session. Uh, Mr. Gentry made the motion. Mr. Henry with a second. All those in favor say aye. Thank you. Under information items, uh, 2022 NCSPRA Blue Ribbon Award. Good Ms. afternoon. Jessica Horn. Oh, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Superintendent Dr. Williamson and board members. I have good news to share with you today, and I ask that you join me at the podium for a brief presentation at this time. All board members. I would like to present these Blue Ribbon Awards from the North Carolina School Public Relations Association to you. This is actually the second year in a row the district has brought home Blue Ribbon Awards for Excellence in Communications and Public Relations. This year, the district received a Silver Award for Publication, Bronze Award for Excellence in Writing, and a Bronze Award for Photography. I'm committed to continuing the improvement of our communication both internally and externally. I'm also grateful to work with people across departments who are just as passionate and committed to the work as I am. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we'll take our picture. <laughs> If I may, I want to say um, congratulations to uh, Jessica, Ms. Horn, and thank you for the outstanding job you're doing with communication, internal and external. We're just thankful that you're part of the public schools of Robson County family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Next is NC Beta Convention update by Mr. Andrew Davis. Okay. How about Junior Beta State President also? 2023 Women's State Wrestling Tournament. Um, Lomerton High School. That would be Mr. Jerome Hunt. Good evening, Vice Chairman Lawson, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, board members. Tonight we have a very special group of coaches and young ladies with us from Lomerton High School. These young ladies won the NCHSAA Women's Wrestling State Championship back on February the 4th. I want to introduce the head coach at this time and then let him introduce his coaches and wrestlers and tell us a little bit about this special group. Uh, this time, head coach, Mr. Jamie Bell. Ladies, y'all come to the front. We want to get... 
Yeah. Hey everybody, uh, superintendents, board members. Uh, I'm Coach Bell, Jamie Bell at Lumberton High School. Uh, this is our women's team. Uh, my coaches, Lauren Little, who's our, our specific girls coach. Uh, my assistant head coach, uh, Teague Little. Our wrestlers here are 114 pounder, Teresa Kennedy, 120 pounder, Aisha McCollum, and our 235 pounder, uh, Winnegal Oxenheim. Um, just kind of explain how, how it went. We had our state tournament on February the 4th, and these three girls all placed in the top three, uh, scoring enough points to make us the tournament champions. Uh, so we're the team state champions for women's wrestling in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate I appreciate everyone's support. Uh, I know I've been posting things on uh, social media, trying to keep everybody involved. I tag PSRC to make sure they they can see everything. And I think the big thing is to promote this for these young ladies and our young men on the uh, the boys team. Because my personal goal is to have something positive said about Robinson County, about Lumberton. Right? There's all this negative stuff on social media. Uh, and I want this to be that bright light, something, right? And we can start somewhere. And this, these girls have done that. They put in the work and uh, everything, blood, sweat, and tears to, ha to give us the opportunity to be proud uh, for girls from Lumberton, girls from Robinson County and our school system. So thank you guys for your support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Tanner. How many, uh, how many schools was in this competition? Uh, total was it, I think it was like 56 teams had girls wrestling, I think something like that, somewhere around that. That's I awesome. don't know the exact number, but there were over, I think it was what, 360 some girls in the tournament. Uh, and there were, like I said, there was probably 54, 56 some teams and we were number one out of all of those. Awesome. So, Ms. Lena. Mr. Ms. Chair, I want to ask Coach Bill, who is that young, good-looking man behind you in the vest? Oh, this, this, this is my father, Judge Greg Bell. Okay. Yes, I was going to recognize him, Dr. Emanuel. Um, Judge Bill keeps us updated on Facebook with all the pictures and stuff of the wrestling. So um, we, th we're, we thank you for being here, uh, Judge Bill. Um. I'm going to present this to Lumberton High School Girls Wrestling on behalf of the public schools of Robinson County in the Invitational Open State Champion. Um, I'll tell you, me and Coach Little, Jamie Bell, we all graduated together the same age. I know firsthand how hard these guys work um, and improve, and they're a staple at Lumberton High School. And I can't say thank you enough to them because these are two, three, I consider Coach Little's wife and as well, three of the best coaches that we probably got in our system in the public schools of Robinson County. So on behalf of public schools of Robinson County, Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work, Coach Bill. Um, Mr. Andrew Davis, if you want, let's go back to the NC Beta Convention update. Good evening, Chairman, Superintendent, and esteemed board members. I'm honored to inform you tonight here that this year we set a record for the most students in schools and winners for the public schools of Robinson County that we've ever had at this year's state beta convention. This year we had 14 schools attend the convention and 35 students who placed at, at the convention and will be eligible for national competition this summer. Those students will be recognized at a later board meeting. The schools that attended included St. Paul's Elementary, Pembroke Elementary, Long Branch Elementary, Union Elementary, Magnolia Elementary, Prospect School, Deep Branch Elementary, Oxendine Elementary, Pembroke Middle, Lumberton Junior, Pernell Sweat High School, Lumberton High School, St. Paul's High School, and PSRC Early College. At this time, I would like to ask Mr. Jamie Burney, who is North Carolina State Beta and Prospect School sponsor to come forward.
Being a leader and representing Beta in Robinson County is an honor. One of our students who has displayed leadership within her community, school, and peers not only represents the epitome of student achievement within Robinson County, but her hard work and leadership and pedigree has now been acknowledged throughout the state of North Carolina. It's my honor and privilege to introduce to you the newly elected North Carolina Junior State Beta President for the 2023-24 school year, Ms. Keeley Deal. Ms. Deal has become a model leader at Prospect School, demonstrating the vision and values that Beta represents, and we are extremely proud of Ms. Deal and all of our Betas for their hard work and achievement, character, leadership, and service. Ladies and gentlemen, your newly elected Junior Beta State President-elect, Ms. Keeley Deal. And mom, dad, and um, this is Craig, if you'd like to come up, take a picture. <laughs> Dr. Williamson, would you like to come up? Come up here, please. Yeah, Mr. Craig. Hello, everyone. As you may know, my name is Keely Deal, and I am honored to accept this. This year, as your newly elected Junior Beta State President, I want to help others learn about their worth and encourage them through going through bullying, oppression, suicide, and depression. I want to let them know that you are worthy of love and you are enough no matter what. Thank you. A FEMA update. Good evening, Chairman Lawson, Vice Chair Lawson, Superintendent, Board members. I'll just give you a quick update where we stand on the FEMA process from Hurricane Matthew. You know, just to recap, back in August, a panel of judges with the CBCA court ruled that FEMA need to review two of the exhibits and uh, that we have presented to them. As of December, this past December, uh, FEMA reached out to the panel of judges to ask for clarification, and that was the first we had heard any response since August. By early mid-January, me, the Department of Emergency Management, and Daniel Amon with Baker Donaldson Law Firm representing us, met and decided to send a letter to the panel of judges requesting that they put a deadline to them responding to the judge's order. Um, two days later, we did get a response from FEMA. It was a 36-page request for information, and we had 30 days to complete it. That was on January 17th. So this Friday, we had to uh, provide the answers to that 36-page request for information. However, FEMA has given us a 30-day extension, and we're, so we're in the process of doing that. It won't take the full 30 days, but we did the extension just in case we needed extra time. And then as of yesterday afternoon, I did get an email from the Department of Emergency Management requesting that I and the architect meet with FEMA either one day this week or next week at the earliest. Uh, so I'm waiting to hear back from them when it would work for them for us to meet. We gave them our dates that we could meet. So that's where we stand at this time. Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hugh, thank you for what you do. This is from the hurricane back in 2016. Um, just to give you information. Um, technology, security, and updates, Mr. Bobby Locklear. Thank <clears throat> you. 
Good evening, Vice Chair, Mr. Lawson, Dr. Williamson, and board members. There's been a lot of talk surrounding uh, social media apps and how that affects our work here at the school district and whether or not we allow those apps to operate on our system and through our network. So we would like to take a few minutes tonight to update the board and the public uh, and where we stand on those apps in our district. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Mr. Teal. Good evening, Vice Chair, Mr. Lawson, Superintendent, Dr. Williamson, and fellow board members. Uh, I'd like to let y'all know, this is a huge undertaking for us to fight day in and day out when we're talking about cybersecurity. People really don't realize our biggest threat is internal, not external. That's those elementary, middle school, and high school kids that we fight on a day-to-day -day basis. You got some that are invoking in technical schools. They use us as a test bed to come back to try to test out any apparatus, software they may bring into our system. We primarily block pretty much anything. If Mr. Brewer called me right now and tell me to block A, B, C, one, two, three, it's done in seconds. You know, if he's sitting right now at his desktop, he's looking at porn, we block it in seconds. And now he goes to another one. We just keep doing it. Now, we can't block the first facial page that comes up because the system got to react to what you do. But once we see it within one to two seconds, it's blocked. As you look at the board up here now, Cole, can you scroll down a little bit more? As you see right here, stop right there. Go back up a little bit, 400, go back up a little bit, 406. This is my email address. I'm probably one of the top people in the district that hackers stick out. Dr. Williamson is next, Miss Erica is second. Reason being, they assume that Dr. Williamson had the key, which he does, to the district. Therefore, he's in all these different pockets. We start talking about finance, curriculum, and that way they, uh, they come out to him. The next person is Miss Erica. Lo and behold, we're talking about finance. They try to trace and track her no matter where she's internal, external. She has VPN uh, access, which is stand for virtual private network. So if she's sitting at home, we have to treat that even more because she's working from home to try to block any type of threat that's coming back this way. If she goes to a hotel and get on that network, we have agents that sit on that, la that laptop to make sure it functions as she will be inside the public schools of Rockford County. Push that even further. When you talk about all these 34,180 some Chromebooks we got running around in the district. They go home, they got that agent on there. That's why we get a lot of kickback from everybody about the restrictions on these laptops. We make it function and look the same way in the classroom as you do in your leisure or your home. It, it's no different. We function because I, I have to adhere on a day-to-day -day basis to SEPA, which is the Child Internet Protection Act, because we get so many millions of dollars annually from E-rate. And that's one of their guidelines that have to put all these restrictions, everything in place to try to block and make sure we don't put no child in harm's way. Cole, can you go to the next slide, please? Like I say, today only, I got hit 406 times. Now, on this next slide, you look here, this is average user. For example, we just, uh, we didn't arbitrarily pick 10 students. These are the top 10 students, no matter what they was doing, they were getting hit and hacked. Or, for example, outside of us, if you go to Walmart right now and get a thumb drive and go outside the free world and download a virus, they try to bring it to the network and try to propagate something to get around our filters, which is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. We call it the trivector effect. If I'm at the senior high school and I come up with a proxy to get around my filter and it's working, and I got a sister in the middle school, guess what? I email it and share it with them. If I got another sibling down to the elementary school, we share it with them. So they work together to try to fight us to go to places they should not go. <laughs> uh, right now, today only, 116,000 threats or attacks that one individual student had because he or she was trying to go to the wrong places. But guess what? We do it like Mike Tyson, try to knock it down as fast as we can. Next slide. Now the first slide was in 10 days. This slide right here is in 30 days. Three million attacks on one individual email account because he or she was trying to go to the wrong place. And guess what? The filters caught them. All right, next slide. Virus threats. They can come in any type of form, but our intrusion protection system or our intrusion detection system picked this up. Right now, in the last 30 days, we had some major threats that you see on CNN, Fox News, that came our way that our system 
that you pay for, that we govern, caught these viruses. Next one. Here, you can't really see it, but these are just average websites and stuff that we blocked. Every, I call it a millisecond that these students try to go to. Next slide, please. Keep going. Now, when you start talking about our filters, these are some of the categories that we use when it comes to shopping, um, uh, porn sites, um, matter of fact, business sites that people try to go to, they got subcategories that we can actually manipulate that we need to try to streamline. If they ask me in, a, in curriculum to block this, if a gaming site, we put it in one of these categories and it automatically block them. Or if it gives us something that kind of look malicious or pornographic, we can put it in one of these pockets and block it on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Now here's one that really that has me before you that everybody's been talking about. That is um, Chat GPT. It is blocked. TikTok. It is blocked again. If Dr. Williams or someone curriculum with the blessing, everybody comes up and say, "Hey, we need this particular website URL, whatever you want to call it. We can block this in seconds." Next slide. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my question is regarding chat GPT. Now, I know it's artificial intelligence based. We don't want the kids using it at school, but what's going to prevent them from overall using it to complete their assignments because they still have access to it at home? Good maybe, not on a, maybe not on a PSRC device, but they still have access to it. Good question. My job to block it happened on our network. Mm -hmm. Anything outside our network is out of my um, control. If it's, not, if it's on our domain, it's blocked. But outside of it, if you got a, a Verizon hotspot like I got on this phone right now, if you own one up here, Saucy Devices, <laughs> you will not get access to it. But now if you go home and try to get on your network, by us having that agent on there, it's still blocked. It. But if you take your own personal device and go to it, there's nothing I can do about that. So is chat GPT a real, is it a threat? Say again, is it a real threat? Or is it just we don't want the kids using it? It all depends on how you want to categorize it. Some people say it's a plus and some people say it's a negative. It all depends on That's, how you do it. I used it. I didn't see it as a threat. I mean, I didn't, I didn't take it as a threat, but mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Cole, can you slide down just a little bit? Uh, go, no, go back up. Yeah. Keep, keep going. Uh, go back down. Go back down. I'm sorry. Uh, this is right here just activity on Friday. As you can see from that bar, we have a lot of action going on. But on the weekend, with the kids and all on our network, it's kind of dormant. But yet still, they still have held a device that belongs to the public schools of Robson County that's still fighting for us, even on the weekend. Now, let's say the month of June or July. That's kind of like we call our dormant season, out of season. There's nothing really major happening on our network, so we really don't have to fight that much. When August come around, that, that bar goes right up. Now, with that being said, our second threat is our administrators. For example, if Mr. Lawson bank was Wells Fargo and if he gets an email from BBNT or what's it called, Truist now, saying, hey, your account has been frozen. He sees that little link on there, but he already knows he does not bank with Truist, but guess what? He's going to click it anyway. But with that being said, again, with the Child Internet Protection Act, we have to do stuff called phishing, where we send stuff out to the teachers, kids, try to alert them on spoofing and all this other stuff because in order for me to continue to get this money on a yearly basis, we have to get them ongoing training to that effect. That's my story. Any questions? Everybody good? Thank you, Mr. Teal. Thank you. Thank you for the job you do. I was just going to give you an example. I was at the, back in November, myself and Dr. Williamson was um, at the convention, North Carolina School Board Convention. And I got an email from Dr. Williamson. But when I went down for breakfast, Dr. Williamson said, I hadn't emailed you. And I said, well, I didn't reply to it because I knew you'd be down here for breakfast. So it, it's just one of those things, you know, you, you don't need it until you need it. And that's the good part. And Ms. Lawson, one thing I need to add, and I failed to mention, with the public schools of Robson County, we had to do some reconfiguring within our staff 
we have what you call a cybersecurity officer. Most school districts do not have this. This is what this gentleman does all day. His name is Daniel Jacobs. He went to school. He trained for it. Matter of fact, I think he just received his master's. But for these threats, <coughs> you know, it's a full-time job. And that's what he does on a daily basis. Just make sure, one, we don't get malware. We don't get ransomware. If someone take over our network and try to hold it hostage, then we got to pay money to try to get it back. He does that on, he does that on a full-time basis for us. Thank you. Mr. Crane. Uh, Mr. Teal, Mr. Teal, how much how much of a problem are we having with uh, the phones that our staff has? As far as um, if it's I'm gonna say spyware or whatever, getting into these phones and getting text messages or whatever from resources that you know we know nothing about, but they're trying to get us to look at different things. I know with mine lately, the last month or two, that's become a big issue. I, is that across the county or? Well, right now, um, Brother Cole helped me with this. Most phones right now, we got MDM, mobile device management on it. If you have that phone within that, we can, again, stop you from going strange places. But if that phone does not have it, would not, does not have it in that pocket, you're at liberty to hit anything. But see, just like on your laptop or your computer, folks get curious. You sit in there, you at the bank, you have, wherever, at the beach, you just steady hitting on stuff, you know, and this fishes, this, you know, and once you download it, it's on that phone, there's nothing much I can do about it. Uh, are we pretty much out of fact? We have a mobile device management system that we use to manage our uh, cellular devices, but I believe what uh, Mr. Craig might be referring to is spam text messages and spam calls and robocalls uh, that we all probably get on a daily basis with work and personal phones. That's really a global problem. And honestly, there's not too much we can do to fight spam text messages and spam uh, robocalls. Uh, I know I get several a day myself that just, you know, you can block the number, but I guarantee you, you're gonna get it tomorrow from a different number. Um, there's not too much that can be done that I'm aware of at that point. Now, as we're referring to the mobile device management system, we can protect the phone as far as the software installed on the phone, but as far as random text messages that you may get that are spam and random robocalls that again are spam, that is incredibly hard to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, you can set certain settings in your phone to reject unknown callers and unknown messages. Um, that works for a lot of people, but obviously you'll miss something if it's not in your contacts. Mine is mainly the text messages and it seems like it's just started. And I wanna say on oh, mine in the, probably the last month, mm -hmm. hardly getting none. And then it's just now it's multiple ones per day. Yeah. And just recently. Yeah. There's stuff that crawls websites. And like once your number is out there and all these numbers at the end of the day, they're, they're public, you know, they may mm -hmm. be private to us, but also randomization. You can spoof a number, you can figure things out. There's no good, honest solution to this problem because if there was, somebody would patent it and somebody would be making a lot of money. Uh, that's the best thing I can tell you. Thank you. Yes. Also, that Mr. Craig. Back in the day when the phones were paid for by the federal government through E-Rate, they had those filters on the phone. But since E-Rate does not pay for our phones anymore, we pay, we're pay. on the open market. So guess what? The rise, whoever, they're selling these numbers on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have no protection behind that. So that's why you're getting all these spams and texts and stuff because it's on the free market now. But when it was the federal government, we had blocks and filters, but now we don't. Any more questions? Mr. Teal. I got a quick Thank question. You. Quick, just one quick question, Mr. Teal. Do we have ransomware insurance? Only thing ransomware pays for is the replacement of the equipment or the lawyers that take you to use a pipe to book all the red tape to get that equipment. But right now it's against the law to pay for ransomware. Insurance? No, not for the insurance, but to pay. You right now hold me for a million dollars. It's gives a lot of us to get myself. Mm -hmm. Miss Erica? It's called a cybersecurity policy through the school boards association. Like you've indicated, Mr. Teal, we can't actually pay a ransom, but they do have a policy in place where we could file for out of pocket costs that we may occur um, when those types of things occur. If we had to provide additional, um, if our employees information was exposed and we had to offer, you know, a year of credit, those kind of things like that are covered under our insurance. We do have a policy for that. 
I said, I, I would just like to add that if it looks suspicious, it probably is. And that's why they put delete on there. Delete's your best friend. And Miss Erica, it's good to see you back tonight. Um, Miss Jessica Warren, Black History Month. Good evening again. February is Black History Month. Throughout the month, we will observe Black History Month by sharing the stories of resilience, strength, and the many contributions of African Americans to our world. Multiple observances are taking place at the school level this month in observance of Black History Month. Thank you. Um, it's time for public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's go to um, information item, points of clarity on curriculum. Mr. Terry. It's my understanding that um, when we ordered the EL curriculum that there would be no references to gender, religion, sexual orientation, and those sorts of things. If we found out or if we determined that those items or those uh, those books made it into our curriculum um, in some way. You know, I thought there was a review process, but from what I can gather, it's kind of difficult to review all this, all these materials. If that made it, you know, into our, our system, um, my just question is why, why are we still, uh, you know, why is it still there? Okay. I've got Dr. Williamson um, and Ms. Wendy Dorsey Carr at the podium and I'll let y'all answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vice Chair. And, um, thank you for your question. I want to talk about several things tonight. One is I uh, hope you had an opportunity to read the article that we ran in, in the local paper trying to correct uh, a lot of misconceptions about uh, the curriculum. Um, a lot of conversation around books and pictures and as part of that. But I want to clarify, none of those books are new. They have always been in our public schools aligned to the standards. That's, that's important. Uh, this is a new curriculum we shared with the board at the beginning of the year. Our process is to spend a year with the curriculum. We're flagging uh, books that we want to take a look at. That is an ongoing process. Unbeknown to the public, we have pulled some, and we're keeping a, a running record. At the end of the year, We'll take that information, we'll sit down with teachers, and we will review that after spending the year with the curriculum. And if, if we need to pull them, we will pull that. That is not a problem. We're not trying to hide anything from anybody. We're transparent. You know, this question around, I tell people all the time, I'm a believer, so I, I believe what the Bible says about everything. And so I want to clarify my point, because I've heard a lot of conversation about what I believe. Um, I believe what the Bible says. Totally. Uh, another, it is standards based, every book. And, and so the standards are showing up at a lower grade level than historically they have. Kids are using vocabulary that normally they would never use until fourth or fifth grade. They're using that vocabulary now with comprehension and understanding and ability to write as early as first grade, as early as first grade. Our invitation is to visit our schools. We want to be transparent. Visit our classroom. Take a look at the curriculum in action. Again, we're not trying to hide anything. Uh, we want to finish out the year with the curriculum, and we are purged. We we'll use parents and teachers to, to do that. I do want to clarify and be clear. In the public schools of Robinson County, to our knowledge, one, we are not teaching critical race theory. We never have. We are not teaching that. So all that misconception of that we are is not true. We are not teaching that. We are not teaching gender identification. We're not doing that. Never have, never will. That's not our place to do that. Um, and, then, and, and then again, we automatically pull some books ourselves uh, to be able to do that. When do you want to add to that any clarification but again, I want to make it clear to the public, we are not teaching those things that's being said. A lot of information has been taken out of context, um, a picture or, or with that. But we invite everyone to take a look. We'll be happy to meet one-on-one, -on -one, visit our schools for clarification. When do you want to add in? 
and like Dr. Williamson said, anytime there is a question about a book, if there's a question, please fill out the forms. We send it straight to the committee for review. So the same process that we've done with other books to make sure that everybody, um, it's still meeting the standards, everything's clear. That's the process we go through and there is a form to fill out and we've taken two to the committee so far. So if there's any questions, please be fr feel free to have those books sent through the committee. So the call, if you share with the group and the public, we had a, we had a visit this week from DPI to take a look at leverage leadership and our new curriculum. Um, will you speak to that? Sure, so Monday we had several people from EdNC and from a DPI come to visit to see what practices we've put in place over the past couple years, and they could see a huge difference from what they saw two years ago. We had somebody that was here two years ago and had been in our schools and just was really amazed with all the progress we've made over the two years with instructional practices we have in place, with how principals are part of the conversations, really leading those conversations, and what observation feedback looks like for those teachers. And so um, they are going to be running an article at some point in um, March or April about the district talking about the progress we've made. Dr. Williamson, um, just for the public clarification, I understand that um, parents can actually come out, get in touch with a principal, and have the opportunity to sit in and see what their kids are being taught. Absolutely, we invite that. We want to be transparent. But we invite parents in our classrooms and buildings to. And again, we're not trying to hide anything. Um, we're trying to be open and transparent. We answer any question that anyone might have. But we're only going to share the facts. Um, and again, the facts bear out um, that that's not true. And in fact, one of the things is that around the major company, we did not purchase from that company. We did not, correct? We purchased, so their curriculum is sold by two companies, Open Up Resources and Imagine Learning. And so we actually purchased the curriculum from Open Up. And it was just because it was packaged better for us with Open Up. So both um, companies sell that curriculum. <laughs> And those, those curriculums are custom made for North Carolina around North Carolina standards. That's why we went with those particular companies. So everything is standards based. And again, those standards are showing up earlier than they ever have in the, in the past. But we're seeing evidence, um, again, of our kids writing better, speaking better, listening to powerful presentations you were in school today and kids presented. Share that, please. So I had an opportunity to go to Piney Grove today and listen to sixth graders present about problem solutions that they had. And so each child was presenting to their peer, giving each other feedback. And it was just great to see that interaction. Um, they were so confident and ready and excited to do those presentations and share what they've learned over the last um, couple weeks. And so the last thing I share is that parent company, the parent company now is a national, international company. And they serve all segments of, of this world and society. That does not mean that we purchase that material, whatever it might be. We purchase North Carolina standards material, but that is a national, international company. To go to the website and to print off uh, their marketing information and present it as if we're teaching that in the public schools of Robinson County is wrong, is wrong. Um, question. Mr. Superintendent, will you put on your state and federal hat for just a moment? Will you address the fact that we get state and federal dollars and address the fact that we can't teach to one segment that we have to teach in order to get state and federal funds that we have to teach to all to be inclusive can, even though this is the Bible Belt and we all believe in Jesus Christ, right. will you address that? I think that's the point that in my speaking with people, I would say, look, we get federal and state funded and there are restrictions, there are rules, there are regulations that we have to be all inclusive with everyone. We do not teach one specific religion we teach more values, we teach citizenship, and that is united across all faith and belief. We, that's the parents to teach whatever religion they want their kids to practice. Will you address the uh, 
thing about funding and what we are liable that we have to do. Right. Yeah, we are bound by federal law. Uh, we're bound by state law. In fact, we're public service that we put our hands on the Bible and said that we will uphold the law. We do have some flexibility in terms of what we teach, um, and, and, we, and we do that. But we are bound by law, bound by uh, state and federal law. I share with people all the time in my life and all of our lives, there are three sets of laws, the laws of God, the laws of nature, and the laws of man. And we can start with the laws of God. The laws of God says you can't violate the laws of man. That's what it says. To violate any of those laws according to the law of God is wrong. So we don't do value judgment. We don't teach values. We expect the home to help us with that. That's where the child first teacher is. We teach character education, how to get along, and we do teach diversity. This is a diverse world. This county is, we're not promoting one group over another. We're not teaching alternate lifestyle. That's none of our business. We're not going to violate somebody. We're not going to you know, discriminate against somebody. And even our employees and farm, I say this, what you do on your private time is your business. When you show up to work, be ready to teach what we need to teach. I'm not gonna get into you. If it shows up and create a problem in our building, then I have to, but outside of that, that's none of my business. I'm not gonna discriminate against anyone, anyone. But I can promise you from my perspective, if we're teaching some of those things, let me know. That's all you have to do. We'll pull it and take a look at that, but we're not gonna violate any of the laws that we are bound by. But neither are we gonna teach things that ought to be taught in the home. I challenge, uh, parents take a look at tv and what's being shown on tv take a look i mean just we can be honest right i'm not saying anything of uh, take a look at tv um we all see it we all see some redefinitions that's the whole job in my opinion to make sure that our students understand that that's the church job to make sure that our kids understand right and wrong we need kids to show up and respect adults and that. But all the things that's floating that we're teaching and promoting, we're not, we're not. And, and one more chair, one, one more comment, may I? Uh, Mr. Superintendent, a general statement to disregard equity and equality. Now, will you just briefly, you got 30 seconds, address the importance of equity funding and equality how that goes in a school system. Would you address that? And they are important, both of them. Absolutely right. The equity part is really about the funding and the money. It says that the value of a pre-K program is we help kids to be at the same starting point so that they can take advantage of all the courses that we offer. That's the equity. We, we witness equity in action tonight. These three young ladies, in a non-traditional sport that if we deny them would not have been in front of you state champs. That's equity in action. That's all it is. All it's ever been is the opportunity to provide for kids to be able to choose what it is, their path that they want to take in terms of education, sports, and those kinds of things. Equity in action is you've added a lot of middle school sports. You provided middle school students an opportunity who more probably won't be on a sports team at the high school, but you provided them an opportunity to participate at the middle school level. Have a conversation with those kids that are participating if they appreciate that, because they do. And so the equality of the money to help us get ready and then the equity of the opportunity for kids to do that. Well, one of the statements going around is this piece about, about outcomes and we expect kids to be. Well, no, the state expects that. That's what the accountability system is all about. It says this, because of equality, because of equity, because of pre-K program, all those opportunities, then, then it says the expectation is based on the state's accountability system, not the public schools of Robinson County, that the expectation and the definition is proficiency. Well, what is that? That is a level three. So the expectation is with federal funding, with state funding, with all the support, 
that we can catch kids up, we can close gap, and at grade three, they'll be proficient. That's the standard, that's the expectation for every student. So it is wrong to say that we should not expect all kids, we should. Now we realize some are gonna hit it in third grade, some it's gonna take a little bit longer. That's why all the other support programs that we have in place. But it is wrong to say we should not expect outcomes for kids. And our goal is every kid to be at least proficient. Proficiency is simply minimum standards that the state have set. We're pushing way beyond that. We want kids going at a four and five. We want kids taking AP classes and we're gonna push for that. Conversation around religion. We want to add uh, a religion class. We met Ms. Gentry and some folks from the community. That is part of the offering that we can do. Is And if kids choose that, we're going to offer that religion class that will cover all religions. That's equity, that's equality in action. So again, we're not denying anyone the opportunity. What we will not do is discriminate against anybody. And the business of the home, we're going to leave to the home. The business of the church, we're going to leave to the church. But the business of education is our job based on the standards and what we have to do. Our intent is for every kid, every kid. And we know that's probably not possible. That was one of the drawbacks of No Child Left Behind, that it had 100% Dr. Manning expectation. Well, that was not realistic. Our expectation is that every kid we have an opportunity to achieve level three proficiency, and we'll not stop until that happens. You wanna know the strength of this school system? The strength of this school system is what are we doing for the weakest child, whoever, wherever that child may be. That is the strength of this district, right? What are we doing for the weakest child? What are we doing for that child that can't read? What are we doing for that child that struggled with math? But the science of how kids learn says you need to move to hands-on applied part of teaching and learning. Our teachers are doing an outstanding job. And uh, I'll say this and sit down. I understand change. Change is hard. I understand that. Well, when we've been doing something a certain way for 10 years, it is hard to change. It's going to take time. We understand that well. But over time, we'll get better. Teachers are internalizing those lessons as never before. We've seen a major turnaround since August and until mid-year now with that. And it's going to get better. We'll spend some time and we invited teachers with the new curriculum to sign up because we want to do some PD this summer to help them design lessons to internalize that. And it will be teachers on teachers. Ms. Craig, you talked to me about that. That's what's going to happen. Well, we invited teachers. We didn't get a, a lot of folks. Well, that's going to be ongoing. Dr. Carr and I talked today. Our uh, beginning teacher, Melissa, we're going to send them through leverage leadership and the training of the new curriculum so that they can get off to a great start. But again, I, I want to be clear. All that misconception that we're teaching, we're not. We're not. It's taken out of context. It's taught as history, some of it. But we are not promoting. What we're promoting and we'll continue to promote is we want kids to be able to do math more. We want all kids to be able to read. We want all kids to be able to write. We want kids to understand history and social studies. On and on and on with that conversation. That's what we're after. Ms. Ocean? Okay. So my question is, what is the direct path where parents can get to that form if they have any inquiries or any concerns? Like where is the form located for them to fill out if they have find material material that they feel is not if they reach out to the school, the school media specialist can give them a copy of the form to the, fill out. The media specialist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Craig. Um, Dr. Williams or Dr. Carr. Um, I know information was put up on I think the county website and all the school websites as far as EL curriculum. Uh, can one of you or both just address maybe how parents, grandparents, how easy it is to get to or how, what they need to do to go to? Because it's got all in, well, it's got a lot of information about the curriculum, what it teaches that uh, I would just ask whoever's listening or looking and if we could start communicating more down here, 
how to get to that site to look at the curriculum. So right now, the direct link to the books themselves is on the main site. We're actually reworking all of our websites by the next two weeks so it's easier to find because we know parents are struggling finding right. exactly where to go. Um, but they can go to Open Up Resources, which is the company that we actually purchase from, and create a free account and look at any of the curriculums um, that are there. So um, we can send that link out, too, to mm -hmm. um, principals, again, to remind them during their parent nights and sending out information to their students that they can share that information. And any parent can actually go into their kid's account on Kidum and look at any of the stuff as far as what they're doing on the student mm -hmm. side too. But if they want to see what the lessons are, they can go to open up resources and mm -hmm. we'll make it a little, we're trying to work on making that website easier right. for them to navigate. Can you talk about no. Canvas, please? They can go in Canvas and see the lessons. And well, it's in Kidum. Yeah, so they'll go into Kidum. So there's a website, Kidum, that is through their Clever login. When kids log into Clever, um, all of them have a Kidum, which is what is the platform that we use for actually L curriculum. And so it has everything that the student can access is there. But any other additional resources like the actual lessons, like I said, you can easily create a free account and open up resources and view any lesson that you want to to see what the kids are um, learning in the classroom. So let's make sure that parents that's looking in Canvas won't continue to look because it's not that right. great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Ms. Ms. Grant, if I may, the, the, the part of it too was if parents go to a school site, they can go on the school site and it's got the questions about EL curriculum. I think we put it up last week. Um, what I seen last week, it was it's on our county website, but to me it was easier to find if you just went to Deep Branch or you went to Lumberton Senior and it were an elementary school. If you went to Hargrave, it's got any school. It's just got EL curriculum and it's got questions answered. It might not be specific as yours, but just to make sure parents understand, you can go there and find answers to questions about this curriculum. And it's on the county website. But to me, it was easier to find if you specifically went to a school. Now, am I correct on that is still up? Yes. So that article ran in the newspaper this weekend, but mm -hmm. it's also on our website at robinson.k12.nc.us. Right. It is under the news section. So if you could just hit the home page, Cole. If you go to the home page and you just scroll under the banner, under to the news section it is right there where our logo is mm -hmm. and that is posted on all of our school websites under the news section so the same area any of those schools you can hit <coughs> hit their website and you can find it under the news section now i update that section a lot so it might get buried right. but it is under the news section so if right. you look in a few weeks it might be a little lower than it is now but for now it's close to the top so any of the schools again you can you can see it there and it should be on most of their facebook sites that were linked to our um website um, yeah. thank you that's what i was referring to okay thank you all right so we are using eel curriculum um you but i'm trying to figure out the connection between eel curriculum and open up resources is open up resources a, a reseller so a vendor. L, L Education does not sell the curriculum because it's a free curriculum. So they don't sell anything. So they just create curriculum and that's it. So only open up and imagine learning actually sell the product. So if we want something uh, hard bound, that's the only way we get it. Otherwise, we could have just like any other school system that wants to, they can download it and use it without paying for it. So a few weeks ago, I wrote a, um, an opinion piece on, on the importance of, uh, of shared governance. And this is not the first time I've been in one of these meetings and I'm hearing words like mis, uh, misconception, miscommunication, misunderstanding. And I'm trying to figure out how um, all of these concepts, misconceptions, miscommunication, misunderstanding, I'm trying to figure out the balance between those and our um, you know, our essentially um, tooting our own horn about how transparent we are. I'm just trying to figure out um, why there's so many miscommunications and all this stuff when we're saying that we're transparent. 
Um, in order to avoid this in the future, I just feel like we need to include more people in the conversations. Um, when we're making these, these decisions at this, at this level, if there's more discussion um, and more people at the table when these decisions are being made, um, I don't think we're, we're gonna be having all these uh, misses, uh, communication, understanding and, and conceptions in the future. We've gotta do a better job of ensuring that um, uh, that multiple stakeholders are at the table when we make these decisions. I would also ask now that, because uh, I'm constantly asking the staff, tell me, have you heard from a parent with a concern about this? This is an open invitation. Uh, we can clarify whatever we need to clarify and we can help keep it in context. That's an open invitation to our public, to our parents. We're willing to sit down and have any conversation. And I'll be the first to say, if we're wrong about something, we're wrong about it. It wasn't intentional. I can't say any more than that. If we're wrong, we'll correct that. We will correct that. And we're constantly reviewing our work and what goes on in our buildings. And we're holding principals accountable for communication to make sure. But again, this is an open invitation for parents to go in our buildings, go in our classroom, come to the district, have a conversation with our curriculum staff. We can clarify any question um, that someone may have. I've heard a lot of conversation about, I think this is what, well, that leads to a lot of misinformation. We can clarify that easily, easily. Ms. Osha? Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm going to play on what Terry just said about misconceptions. It's not in kind of like a devil's advocate because I have this position, but I'm also a parent. And we can't get a message out to a group of people that aren't available. Um, when you go to curriculum nights, like I went last week, and you have a student body of over 200 kids and you only have 15 parents there, you're going to have misconceptions because you have two parents that are dead set on downloading things from the website and saying we're teaching our kids this because they're showing me, they're showing it to me not realizing that as a parent, they're showing it to me. Like, you know, they're teaching our kids this in third grade, but there's, and they're showing it out to other parents. So that's where misconception comes in because you have one parent that comes to curriculum night, and they have their mind already set up and they're passing along to people that have no idea what's really being taught and what's, what's really going on. Do I think our curriculum needs a little, so we, we do need to mainstream it a little bit more, go in and, and vet it a little bit more? Yes, I, I totally agree because um, I'm a parent as well and I don't agree with my daughter being taught certain things. But just like Dr. Williamson said, those some things are left for home, some things are for church, and you know some things they go to school for education. Um, some things they they're going to have to know. But a lot of our misconceptions in this county come from non-participation. Um, a lot of a lot of us relay or rely on other people to give a message instead of coming to the source. So what I'm saying is, I invite people to go to the source, go to your school ask questions, get relevant information, because you're never going to get a, a exact answer by asking another person that may not understand. Yeah. Jennifer, help me out. In March, we're going to have family engagement opportunities, talk about Title I, talk about the curriculums and those kinds of things, correct? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Yes, we will have pre-planning meetings with federal government, uh, with federal programs. We are required by the federal government to involve parents in those conversations. So early in March, we will actually hold parental involvement meetings. We have them annually. We have a schedule of events, and we'll begin in March having conversation about where we are, where we are going with federal programs, and how we spend our money in our district. One of the attempts to this past year to assist with that is Ms. Ocean going back to an original conversation we had earlier in the fall when we had some confusion about and parent involvement, how we work with the ELA education, how we're getting our curriculum information out. We set up regional meetings in the district 
We put out fillers. We went into each region because part of that work was to actually go into the regions because as you work in the district this large, there are similarities, but sometimes there's differences as well. So with that being said, we did hold our regional meetings. We didn't have a lot of participation, but that did not discourage us. We'll continue to go out. We'll continue to work through that process. But I also wanna add on one thing too. In our school improvement plan, we've encouraged E106, which is an indicator about family engagement and community involvement and fully implemented, how does that look? So we've spent a great deal of time with our principals over the, this past summer, how we're going to engage parents and what we need to do. So we're aware that we need to continue to extend that right hand of fellowship and we continue to acknowledge that as we go out. We do want our parents, we do need them because it is a partnership. In Title I, I am finishing up an audit and I'm working really diligently to ensure that we have the Title I Compact, which is what we offer each and every year annually. It's a requirement, but not only is it a requirement, if we take that document seriously, that compact is simply one document that says <laughs> it's a partnership. It's a partnership between us and the home. So we encourage and appreciate your encouraging parents tonight because that's one area that I'm passionate about. Many, many years ago, I was a family engagement specialist in my younger years. So I know the value, but I also know the hard work to get individuals out and to get that message out. So thank you. And we will continue in March. We'll also have another meeting in May. We'll have continuing meetings throughout the summer as well. Okay, Mr. Lante. Um, I would like to say, Dr. Williams, um, thank you for clearing the air on the EL curriculum, um, the misconception stuff that we got out there. Um, I also want to say that this is a two-year contract, correct? So so I just want to put this out there. But at the end of these two years, before the end of it, we will evaluate the effectiveness of the EL curriculum for our district before we extend this contract, before we go into another contract. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes, Thank sir. you. That's the process, yes. Mr. Terry. Will parents have an opportunity to serve on that um, committee? They did the first time around. Talk about that, um, when, if you will. So we had the district improvement team meeting where we had some parents. So we have, and we're trying to increase their, our parent attendance too. That was just a discussion we had last week. We started off with 20 some parents and our numbers have dwindled from across the district. So we're trying to encourage those parents to come, but we did have a district improvement team meeting where parents were part of that meeting to review the resources that we're um, to use during those days. And then the other part of the process, we had staff members that reviewed the material, pulled some before we ever rolled it out, correct? Tell me about that. We did, we actually pulled all the media specialists to help us to review all the books, to make sure that all the books were okay, because that's one of the things we wanted to make sure. So we had media specialists with Dr. Baldwin when she was here, review all the books, K-8, um, that were on the curriculum list to make sure that it met the requirements as far as use in our district. And again, if, if we missed something, we apologize. Let us know and we'll take a look at it at the end of the year and we'll pull it. Again, we're not trying to hide anything. Um, um, we want to help kids, and there's evidence of that. Our goal this year is to come off the state local forming list, and we think that's going to happen for us on that. Mr. Terry, thank you for asking the question. Um, um, Trey, you and I talked earlier about this opportunity, so thank you for giving us a chance to, to talk about the curriculum. And again, I invite parents to come sit down and talk with us. Okay. Anything else on curriculum, Mr. Terry? Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Williamson. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Um, I just want to say from my standpoint, um, I appreciate all the questions that you have asked. I appreciate Dr. Williamson answering them um, and being transparent. Um, we need more parent involvement. Um, and I'll say this, as a board member serving for the last 11 years. I do not support it. The CRT and all the other things that come with it. And I don't believe I have served with this board for at least three or four years, okay? And I don't believe that you support it. I just want the public to know that. Um, 
and we can move on from this. Like Dr. Williamson said, if there's anything that's out there that your um, parents, that you're dissatisfied with, you have the opportunity to go to school, uh, come to the central office and it'll be looked into. I know that there are some books that have already been pulled um, that was addressed. Um, but blasting social media is not getting us nowhere. So um, if, if we do this the right way, and I feel like that everybody's heart is in the right place, and that is to educate um, to the best of our ability the kids in um, the public schools of Robinson County. Um, we'll move on. Um, Supervisor retaliation, Mr. Terry. So Dr. Williamson said something a few minutes ago that um, that was interesting and it is, it's true. So with our employees, essentially, you know, uh, you said what, what you do on your own time, you know, that's that's up to you. Um, if hypothetically, if there's uh, if there was a, um, a teacher or an administrator or an employee, um, if there was an employee in our school system uh, that was interested in, in attending an, an event um, after hours on Saturday or whatever. The event may be at a community center, at a church, uh, one of those uh, public type venues. Um, what's the ramifications of a supervisor saying uh, to that employee, you better not attend this event? I wanna, I wanna start by, from my perspective, um, in, in fact, Trey, you and I had this conversation. Pastors are held to a higher standards. Educators are held at a higher standard in the eyes of parents and communities. And what we say is don't let what you do on the weekend become a problem for you in, on Monday at the job. If you're out and you're posting pictures on social media, that's, that becomes a problem. It becomes a barrier to teaching and learning in our public schools. And that's the issue we're dealing with a couple of cases now. Um, again, what you do on Saturday night, that's your business. I don't want to know. I want you to be able to show up on Monday morning and teach. But when you put it on social media and everybody sees that, we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that. Melissa, remind folks, and let's talk really what folks sign off on in terms of the ethics that they sign. That's, that's important because that's a clear violation for a couple of things that we've seen, right? Yes, sir. Um, as a matter of fact, I had to share that with a principal today, the Code of Ethics. It is very specific in the role of a teacher and how we are, as educators, are supposed to um, conduct ourselves. As Dr. Williamson said, we are held to a higher standard, just as preachers or um, other people are. We are expected to um, conduct ourselves. Um, but um, the code of eth ethics is very specific in um, being a role model and those things that we should abide by and how we should conduct ourselves publicly. I'm not saying that these individuals are going out or protesting or you know walking around with signs or climbing, you know, climbing light poles and setting cars on fire. My question is. If, a, if an individual wants to attend an event at church or at their community center, what are the ramifications of a supervisor just telling this person or just telling these individuals, you better not attend this event? I'm not saying participating, attend. It, it's, it sounds like you're not talking about a hypothetical. It sounds like you're talking about a specific instance. And that, in that case, it would probably be appropriate to find out more about what exactly happened. There's probably two sides to that story. Um, and uh, the, probably the better way to handle that would be to get that information to the administration, let them consult with legal counsel if necessary and get appropriate advice on the actual facts and circumstances instead of a hypothetical that 
you can't really answer it without knowing what you're talking about. Because you can answer the hypothetical one way and then try to apply it to the specific instance and find out that the specific instance has nothing to do with the hypothetical or that there's a whole lot more to that story than what came out in the hypothetical. So I would suggest that there's a better way to deal with this than trying to hash it out with a hypothetical at a board meeting. Okay. Ms. Ocean. As far as the code of, code of ethics, how is it presented to our employees? Is it part of their um, hiring packet? Is it an annual thing that they have to sign? Because I know year, annually I have to sign off on the code of ethics for the company that I represent. Um, it's very detailed, it's in-depth, and it's signed off on annually. So do our employees sign off on this annually? Do they only see it when they're hired? How does that work? And um, it is a part of the um, Board of Education um, website. You can find that information there, but also our principals at the beginning of the school year when they have their orientation, they present this to the staff. It may be digital. I don't know that they are still doing it as hard copies, but they are made aware of it and should know where to go to find that information. Okay. I'm gonna make this suggestion. With it being, with us being such a large entity, I think it will be better because looking at a digital copy or looking at a hard copy of Code of Ethics is basically, I'm looking at it, I'm putting it down. If you want people to actually abide by it, because it's actually like, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's contractual. I feel like that's something we may need to look at, at having them sign. Because you can't, we, we can't control what people do outside of work, but if it affects their work, then we need to have something in writing saying this is the set of rules we gave you you signed it and then you have a leg to stand out on what on these things that continue to happen so that's just my suggestion mr molly and i'd like to add to what ms thompson stated as well this year i presented a list of the what i call the top 10 policies that employees or principals should share or must share during their open faculty meeting. And so I'll be glad to share that out with everyone. But within that is some of the information when we uh, refer to ethics, but it touched on employee policies, family policies that go back to Title I and also specific student policies. But yes, that was shared with principals at the beginning of the year to use in their open faculty meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Terry, you're good, okay. All right. Action items. The 2023-2028 um, Public Schools Ross County Strategic Plan. Yes. Um, Dr. Williamson, Dr. Carr. I'm going to yield to Dr. Carr and she very quickly walk us through. So good evening again, Vice Chairman Lawson, Superintendent, Superintendent Williamson, and board members. Um, in front of you, you should have a copy of the strategic plan. And what you'll notice that our strategic plan is really a focus on leadership. So what you'll notice on the front cover, it is all about the principals and being instructional leaders in the building. Um, this plan focuses on five big initiatives, framework for support, principals as instructional leaders, equity, modern and innovative learning environments and systems, excellent professionals and communication and community engagement. We had all the principals and the district improvement team come together about uh, two weeks ago so that they could review this plan and give us feedback and make any changes from there. And um, this is our final version after everybody providing some additional input um, into our strategic plan for the next five years. That is based on what we saw in our Cognia assessment. So part of the accreditation and part of our comprehensive needs assessment that we have to do Every year, we look at all the data and make decisions based on stakeholder feedback in all of our assessment data. And so this is what drove the strategic plan for this upcoming um, cycle. Any questions about the plan? Dr. Emanuel? Walk, walk us through. Did you have a guide from the state? In other words, they had some values or some 
things that they're telling all districts, these are the things, these are our values or these are our steps that we're going to do and we encourage the districts to follow these guidelines or these steps or these whatevers. So if you look at Operation Polaris that um, Superintendent <laughs> True put out, a lot of these similar things that we have in our plan are represented in our plan. So based on what the state put in the plan, a lot of this stuff okay. is almost now, duplicated. All right, let me, let me mm -hmm. make it simple mm -hmm. for me. So the state came up with core values, core beliefs, or core actions. Then we sort of framed ours around what the state's right. requiring. Right. Then when the schools do their school improvement plans, they will follow what the strategic plans work. And so it's like a trickle down. So we're all working together. Is that correct? Yes. So this mirrors everything, like we, like you said, in the state plan um, tailored to the district based on what the state had in their plan. And then when this is approved, we'll take it to the schools. And as we revise our school improvement plans, they'll trickle that down into their school improvement plans. The only thing, and I know it's impossible to do, it would be nice if we could put some dollar signs with some of these, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to make one more statement and I'm finished. If you look at the values in it, look at the third one where it says, um, Fourth one, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Would you read that one? Sure. So anybody that's out in the audience that they could hear it, please just for comfort me. I mean, just make me happy and read it out loud. Okay. Inclusion. Inclusion. Value people for who they are. Nurture diversity. Ensure access to opportunities. Promote a sense of belonging. And embrace the contributions of all students families, and staff in order to strengthen the school community. So this is what we're saying. We're going to, one of the things, I value is that we're going to work towards the next five years, and that does include diversity. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gentry. I, I think uh, with the, the dialogue that you, uh, Dr. Paul, and Dr. Daniel just had, uh, may have answered my question. Uh, my question is, uh, is, is there a, a monitoring instrument for this? And I'm knowing what I know about school improvement plans, ultimately there will be a monitoring instrument about how these goals are being met. Right, so just as you see these objectives, we will have to review these objectives on a regular basis to see are we working towards those at the pace that we need to and what changes we need to put in place. And so that's why you'll see a goal, I mean an objective for each goal for us to know where we're heading and to monitor that progress. So the first academic year for um, for this plan to kick in will be 23-24? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. I had an another quick question. I'm glad that all of these are, um, are measurable. When will we uh, get the first uh, baseline data? Will, we, will our baseline data be um, for, for this year? Okay. So we're collecting data this year. That's part of the reason this plan has not started because then we'll have that baseline data to say we're moving towards those goals. And when will when will we? Um, so, in, as far as um, uh, update to the board um, on the the status of all of these um, objectives and these measurables, we can maybe set that for um, maybe summer of twenty four. Yes, at that point, because a lot of these we need the whole year to in order to get yep. the data, but we could also do a checkpoint probably mid-year to show where are we at at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. On page 12, one, just one more thing. On page 12, under uh, objectives A and B, um, by 2028, uh, PSRC will increase efficient systematic communication by 5% annually with our stakeholders as measured by varied and strategic communication methods. I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna measure that. So we had a lot of discussion about that. Jessica does get reports as like thrill share and how many and how many hits on Facebook and different types of things. Also, we have sign-ins from all of our meetings. So we, it depends on the platform which way we would have to measure it. So Facebook would be one saying how many hits we're getting on Facebook or shares. Um, same thing with thrill share, how many people it's going out to. So we will have use all of those together to see is there an increase from those. 
Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, and then when you correct me, we're in the process of pursuing district-wide accreditation. Uh, that would be for five years. Mm -hmm. At two and a half years, we'll come up for a review. It's our intent to align this strategic plan with that review. So two and a half years into it, we'll present the board with a report. Okay, and this is an action item, so I need a motion and a second to accept it. Mr. Gentry with the motion, Mr. Avante Leach um, with the second. All those in favor, say aye. All opposed, none, that is good. Um, I would like to say I, this, I haven't seen this in a long time. So I'm glad we're working on that. Let me also say that I didn't miss public comments, but I did miss it. Um, but there is no public comments. Okay. So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, naming football field at Red Springs High, uh, Mike Smith Stadium, Mr. Jerome Hunt. Good evening again. At the last board meeting on January 10th, I brought before you an information item to name the new football stadium at the Red Springs High School Complex, Mike Smith Stadium. We held a public forum at Red Springs High School on January 18th with approximately 40 people in attendance. After several presentations, the majority was overwhelmingly in favor of naming the football stadium, Mike Smith Stadium. Tonight, I would like to bring to you in the form of a proposal to name the new football stadium at Red Springs High School, Mike Smith Stadium. Okay. Mr. Henry. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we uh... Uh, we honor the wish of the community in Red Springs High School and named the school after Mr. Mike Smith. Um, Mr. Trey Britt, second. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? No. In his motion, he said name the school. I you meant the football state. Okay. I didn't want anybody to say that we renamed the school. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. All you those will. opposed? Having none, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Rohn. Thank um, you. Mike Smith will have a name in Red Springs forever, which is good. Um, policy updates. Mr. Gentry? I don't see the light now. Yeah, you get, we're going to get you on. Uh, the policy committee uh, met on February the 2nd, 2023, to review uh, fall of 2022 policy updates. All were found to be thorough and brought uh, public schools of Robson County up to date on all uh, current uh, issues that require policy addressing. In addition to the printed booklet, the committee also considered addendums uh, added to uh, clarify graduation for uh, requirement, graduation requirements. There were minor uh, editorial uh, eight, uh, additions. And at this time, I would like to uh, recommend that the board accept the recommendations of the policy committee. Mr. Gentry with a motion, Mr. Henry Brewer with the second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, none. Motion carries, Mr. Gentry. Um, Ms. Erica Setzer, 2022 physical audit. Good evening, Vice Chairman, Mr. Lawson, Superintendent Dr. Williamson, and board members. I'd like to introduce again Mr. Lee Grissom um, with S. Preston Douglas and Associates to go over our year ending 2022 fiscal audit. You have a summary copy that went out with your board packet. We're right now in the review process with the LGC, and once that has been finalized, we'll send the entire audit out to everyone. 
All right. Good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, so I'm here to present the audit for June 30th, 2022. Uh, good news, it's a clean audit report, also referred to as unmodified um, audit report. So we issued four audit reports on these financial statements. Three of them are the traditional uh, audit opinion, which you think of on the financial statement audit piece. And then because of all the federal and state money, we had to do a lot of compliance work. Um, for this for this audit, we had uh, total state expenditures, grant expenditures of 173 million. Um, excuse me, excuse me. The the federal uh, expenditures were 82 million, and the state were 181 million. So um, a lot of compliance field work. We began the audit in June and finished up um january 31st so one of the good things about this particular audit is we finished two months earlier than last year so um school board had had issues getting us everything the last couple of fiscal years so we made big improvements getting the audit out um two months earlier so um, kudos to the staff um, did a terrific job we had no disagreements with management we found no illegal acts um we did not use other auditors and there were no material journal entries found during the audit. And just to point out, the financial statements are 77 pages, um, very stressful to put together every year, and staff did a terrific job. Um, and going back to the four audit opinions I said, there were no no findings this year. I don't know if I've made, made that clear. The, uh, the feedback's throwing me off a little bit on this thing. I don't know. If, but anyway. Um, but overall, too, the fiscal year was really strong. The net position increased by 47 million. General fund added 567,000. School uh, the school fund service um, fund added 580,000. So it was a really strong fiscal year. Also, one notable thing: the pension liability for you accounting nerds um, decreased by about 50 million, which is pretty crazy. But that's the actuarially determined number uh, for your pension liability, but it went down uh, basically because the market was pretty strong a year ago. So that was kind of a, that that's a year behind. So if the market's trending downward, we may see that liability increase next fiscal year. But again, overall, um, again, we issued four audit opinions. We got an unmodified clean opinion. That's the highest level assurance. And then we had no findings um, for the three com compliance audit opinions. Is there any questions? Okay. Okay. I need um, a motion and a second to uh, receive, Mr. Vontae. I'd like to make a motion. We'll accept the audit as presented. Second. Mr. Okay. Henry Brewer with a second. And before we go, I want to thank Ms. Eric and her staff for doing a fantastic job. Uh, thank you for what you do for the public schools of Robinson County. And thank your staff. They get an excellent, once again, excellent audit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Who, too? I forgot. Thank you, too. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? None. Motion passes. Why do y'all think I was saying, glad to see Miss Erica back? <laughs> All right, Miss Erica on the monthly financial report. Can we do the budget resolution? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Lawson, thank I'm you, sir. Miss it. Thank you, Miss Erica. Thank That's you. what you're here for. So you also find included in your information the budget resolution, and as I've explained this, the budget that we presented in December, the 60 plus page, this is the summary of that that our audit firm uses um, as a baseline for determining our compliance with um, our budgeting system. So it's a three page document that summarizes all of those codes and all of those funds into a purpose function structure that I'm asking for approval tonight. Okay, on the budget resolution, we need a motion and a second. Make a motion. All right, Mr. Henry with the motion, Mr. Craig Lowry with the second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? None. Motion passes. Miss Erica, 
And I also included the monthly financial report. And as you'll see, all the budgeting items are updated there for all funds. And I can answer any questions anybody has on that financial report. Mr. Craig? Yeah. No, nothing new, Ms. Eric. I make a motion we accept the uh, monthly financial report. Um, a motion by Mr. Craig, seconded um, by Ms. Ocean to accept the monthly financial report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, no. That also passes. And yes, sir, Mr. Craig. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Erica. I would like to make a comment that you're going to get me. This is Mr. Hunt's last night at a meeting. He, I know he's been waiting, knowing if anybody said anything, I was. But uh, we recognized him at the shootout and everything. And uh, uh, he got, a, I'm not going to say what he got that night. But uh, <laughs> this is, I think, his last meeting before retirement. And I would just like, I'm sure everyone will, just to thank Mr. Jerome for what he's done with our athletic program year. And we're all appreciative. And uh, Mr. Patterson, you're fixing to get on the hot seat. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Jerome. Mr. Craig, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Jerome, I've called on many occasions and um, would tell him what I, the issue was I had and if he didn't know, he surely found out. So, and I would get a call back in just a few minutes. I appreciate what you've done for the public schools of Robinson County, Mr. Hunt. Um, Mr. Trey, if you'll make the motion to go into closed session, sir. I move that the Board of Education for the public schools of Robinson County go into closed session for the purposes of discussing certified and classified personnel, North Carolina General Statute 143-318. Uh, 1 1 a 1 and 6 and to consult with the attorney retained by the board in order to preserve the attorney client privilege between the attorney and the board of education for the public schools of Robinson County North Carolina general statute 143-318.11 a 1 and 3 I have a motion and second to go into closed session all those in favor aye all those opposed motion carries
motion and a second to come out of closed session, please. Trey Britt with a motion. Mr. Henry with a second. Mr. Henry Brewer with a second. All those in favor, aye. All those opposed? Um, yes. Mm -mm. I need a, um approval of personnel. Train uh, Henry with the mo with the motion. Vonte with the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. I need a motion and a second for closed session minutes. Monte, Trey got the second. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed? Um, just for information, um, we've got a construction committee meeting on the 21st at 5. Mr. Bobby, if there's any way you can move it up. I'm talking about like to three or so. Um, if you can make the contacts and just let us know. Um, the the sports, there's some teams from Robinson County in the playoffs and stuff. So to give them a chance to go to the ball games or whatever, if we can get that done. Okay. Anybody else have anything? I will remind the board. Um, at our March board meeting, we would need to adjust our April board meeting. I think uh, the meeting date is during spring break. But just as a reminder, we need to move that. So we need, so we need to move the April board meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just information. You look at your calendars and come up with the dates, and we'll discuss that in March. If nothing further, I need a motion to adjourn in a second. Um, Miss Melissa Ocean with the motion, Mr. Vonte with the second, all those, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gentry, all those in favor say aye, all opposed, this meeting's adjourned.